All right, I guess I'll start. Hello, everyone. My name is Luke Wagner. I'll uh, be talking today about WebAssembly. So first, a little bit about me. I'm an engineer at Mozilla. I've been at Mozilla for six, almost seven years. Uh, first in the JS Engine engineer and now research engineer. Uh, most of the time, though, I've been hacking on SpiderMonkey, which is the name of our JavaScript engine. And uh, confusingly enough, we also name our projects with Monkey. So I've worked on uh, some of our retired JITs, TraceMonkey, JaegerMonkey, our current optimizing uh, Monkey, uh, IonMonkey, and OdinMonkey, which is the ASM.js optimizations that feed into IonMonkey. I'm also the co-chair of a co-chair of the WebAssembly 3C community group. And today I'm going to talk first uh, about what is WebAssembly, why do we need it, give a little tour, show some, some code, show you can call it from JavaScript, talk about APIs, uh, then say talk more about what's coming in the future beyond compiling C++ and uh, how will WebAssembly be used, we might guess, and uh, will WebAssembly replace JavaScript, which, just spoiler alert, is no. So what is WebAssembly in one slide? It's a, it's a new standard being developed in a W3C community group with Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla all participating. Um, it <coughs> defines two things, uh, a compact portable binary format, which is fast to load and runs safely at predictable near native speed, and a one-to-one -one text format that is rendered by developer tools when viewing source. So there's a lot of keywords in this definition. I want to talk about a few of them. Compact means we're you know, trying to optimize over the wire size here. Its goal is to be able to download less code. Portable means we want to keep the same portability as JavaScript. We want it to run the same on all browsers, on all architectures, all independent of the machine. We want it to be fast to load, a lot faster to decode a binary format than to parse JavaScript. Of course, it has to be safe if it's on the web. You can't be allowing you know, reading random bits of memory. It uh, basically has to be kind of the same security profiles JavaScript. And lastly, we want it to run predictably at near native speed. You, you shouldn't have to be a JavaScript VM engineer to understand what the performance of your idiomatic code is going to be. For the text formats, one to one means that we can go back and forth between the binary and the text formats. You can get a binary, go to text, make a tweak, add a printf, go back to binary and load that. It's also uh, another important aspect is viewing source. We, you know, that's an important part of the web and we want to preserve that. You should be able to you know, view your, your um, WebAssembly binary, even though it's binary over the wire, and we'll see some examples of that. So that's the kind of formal definition, but what is it really? Is it a, is it a floor wax or is it a dessert topping? And it's a couple of things, just depending on where you're coming from and what you want to do. So first, uh, if you're starting with, you know, coming from a pers uh, perspective of I have a portable code base, this is a new compiler target for the web. Pro importantly, it's not a programming language. It's something you would compile from programming languages. Although technically with the text format, you can actually write WebAssembly directly, just like you can write assembly language directly. Um, but for the most part, we're expecting people to compile it. Coming from a Java, JavaScript perspective, this is a JavaScript feature. It adds the, gives you a feature with the ability to efficiently load large amounts of code, get predictable near native performance, and this is a, a powerful library building tool. And we'll see some examples of what people are already doing with that today. From more of a theoretical perspective, it's a virtual CPU. This is uh, not specific to any one you know, ARM or x86, but we're trying to be as close to the physical machine instructions as safety and portability allow. So I'll give a few examples. Uh, Int32add is a, is a really direct mapping. You know, that's exactly what you have in x86 and ARM. Uh, call is a pretty direct mapping, but there's slight differences. In x86 pushes the return value on the stack, ARM branch and link sticks in a register. WebAssembly abstracts over that. Oops. Load is, uh, you know, it is more interesting. You know, the hardware, of course, has load and store, but it just, we can't let the user load and store from anywhere in the process. That could be the browser's memory, that could be another origin's memory. We need to lock it to only the slice of memory that's allocated to that particular WebAssembly instance. And so the check here can mean uh, uh, different things. On 64-bit, actually, there's no dynamic check. We do tricks with how we map memory so that way every load and store is either safely in bounds or safely in a, in a fault region when we can handle that trap and uh, do the right thing safely. So there, there's actually no checking overhead on 64 bits. On 32 bit, where we have less address space, um, we've designed the loads and stores so that the checks are hoistable so one check can safely guard you know, multiple or even a loop of loads and stores. And a fourth way to look at this, if you've been following the, the ASM.js saga, is this is the evolution of ASM.js. If you haven't been following, the one sentence TLDR is ASM.js is an extraordinarily optimizable low-level subset of JavaScript that can be compiled from languages like C and C++ and shipped on the web today. 
So uh, we'll talk a little more about AsmJS in a second, um, but a good first approximation is to think of WebAssembly as a binary encoding of AsmJS with tweaks to make it a better compiler target. So two cases where the, the mapping's quite direct, you know, AsmJS already has its own version of int32 add, it's x plus y or zero, and I won't go into that particular JavaScript details of why, but that maps directly to a single int32 add, and WebAssembly is able to express that even more directly just as a single opcode. Um, similarly for a call, AsmJS requires you coerce the return type. That's what makes it so optimizable as you know the signatures of all calls ahead of time. Um, load is more interesting, that's why I have the, the squiggly arrow. In, in JavaScript, we simulate the heap of C++ with one big typed array, so just a big array of bytes. And that allows us to both achieve what people in C++ need to do, which is all sorts of crazy point arithmetic, um, but it's also really fast to compile. So uh, we use a typed array and an integer to represent the pointer. And you know the, the pointers are byte indexed and the typed arrays are int indexed, so that's why I have to do the goofy shift, which has the effect of auto aligning your pointer, which is actually probably not what you wanted to do. So you know WebAssembly fixes that corner case and unaligned loads just work. Similarly, out of bounds with the typed array gives you undefined with the or zero goes to zero. Probably you didn't, if you want to access out of bounds, you, you, you want to default or know that you made a mistake, not just get zero back, and WebAssembly is able to fix that too by introducing uh, new semantics for the N32 load. So that's you know, four, four ways we can think about this, but why do we need this new target feature CPU ASMJS++? To explain that, I'm going to give a little bit of a history of ASMJS. So AsmJS started with mscripten, which was just initially a personal project to see is this even possible. So just plug in a backend to LVM, which is an open source compiler framework that's used in the shipping compiler of OSX today. And it started off just as a part-time project and it worked better and better and we got more interested and then it became a full-fledged research project. And during this time, mscripten was finding the sweet spot of JavaScript performance at the same time as the JavaScript performance wars were making that sweet spot, sweet spot way faster. So, what started off as kind of amusement turned out to be like, wow, we're, we're really getting close to native performance here. So AsmJS was started to say like, how close can we get within the constraints of JavaScript? So AsmJS constrains the type of JavaScript and defines this pattern so that we can see that pattern in the VM and take a fast path that gives us predictably really good machine code. And in 2013, we published this subset so that other browsers could see the same subset, do the same optimizations. We shipped those optimizations in Firefox, and we were able to demonstrate that on some large uh, game engines that were, you know, three, we showed initially the uh, Unreal Engine 3, which was like three to four million lines of code, I think, and ported in less than a week using mscripten. And uh, then over the next few years, you know, other engines started to do the same optimizations, and today we have AsmJS optimization shipping, or under development in Edge, Chrome, and Safari, and because the performance has continued to get better and it's quite good enough for plenty of applications, a lot of large companies are now shipping using mscripten and asm.js. So that's the backstory. And in the context of WebAssembly, we think this dem really demonstrates the, you know, the real demand and excitement for compiling to the web. And talking to developers, like, why, why do you want to do this? You know, a lot of big reasons. Uh, one is to avoid plugins. They're, they're obviously on a, a deprecation path over the long term. Um, they have friction, you know, users being asked to click to install a thing with the scary warnings that could own your computer, and of course, because they can own your computer, there's a big security risk. Um, another reason is bringing large applications to the web where you've already invested in writing all this code, you don't want to rewrite it into JavaScript. Um, another reason is porting high-performance C++ libraries to, for use within a bigger JavaScript application. And lastly, to get to more predictable near-native performance. Uh, okay, well, that's, that justifies AsmJS, but why WebAssembly? So talking to developers over the last three years, we've you know, gotten a lot of feedback, and we know we need to, to go farther, to push farther and, and beyond what AsmJS allows us to do. So uh, one, we need to further reduce the load time, especially on mobile. When you have 10 megabytes of JavaScript, that can take you know, tens of seconds to parse, just to parse, not even to generate the machine code on mobile, which you know, we, we need to do better than that. We need, want to reduce the over-the-wire size, both with and without compression. We want to reduce the runtime cost of representing the code. Because it's JavaScript, you can call to source on it, which means even if we have the machine code, we have to keep around the JavaScript source. And if other metadata support corner cases of JavaScript. Um, so there's some new features we, we want to add, like dynamic linking that don't fit neatly into this ASM.js framework. And uh, just we have to keep pushing towards native performance just because each 10% you know, just saves cycles, saves power, saves, you know, allows people to do more. Another feature, if anyone's been following this, um, that everyone wants is to be able to do shared memory multi-threading, compile p-threads. 
Um, but that one actually doesn't require WebAssembly. That one, there's a feature coming to JavaScript and WebAssembly. It's the ability to share memory between workers that will allow us to do multi-threading. So in summary, you know, we, we want to have it all. We want to do it all, and we want to do it on the web. So where are we now? Uh, WebAssembly is a work in progress. Um, the exciting news just a few weeks ago is we reached a milestone with Firefox Chrome and Edge of an interoperable demo, which is over here. And it's just you know, the old uh, Unity Angry Bots demo, which you know, runs as Asm.js today. But the exciting thing is you know, it's running the same bits in multiple browsers, um, and which shows just a lot of work to converge on, 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 on what the standard is and agreement on all these important details. So that's the, the milestone we reached recently, and this is running as WebAssembly, and you have to uh, enable a pref to get to it in Firefox Nightly. But uh, yeah, we, we want to keep iterating on this um, to get towards a stable spec uh, in something we can ship in the browsers. And it's hard to, you know, the big question everyone has is when's this going to ship? And it's hard to know precisely when because it's, it's a consensus-based approach. But as, as best as we can guess, our, our intentions are, not they come true, but our intentions are to be able to ship something this year. So beyond that, uh, a broader design choice of web, web assemblies, we're going to specify and ship it iteratively. So, you know, this is just a general theme for the whole web is, you know, make the smallest thing you can that solves a problem, get that out there, get feedback, and use that to iterate and guide where you're going. And so for this initial release, we already know Asm.js is this valuable thing that a lot of people are using. And we know we can do one step better for sure by all those things we listed earlier. So this initial release is, is going to be basically kind of better Asm.js. And as a side effect, that means we can actually polyfill WebAssembly code before it's in all browsers using Asm.js. And we have demonstration of this being able to polyfill it by generating Asm.js and WebAssembly on the server or sending just WebAssembly to the client and translating it to Asm.js on the fly in the browser. We actually have demos of that working. Um, but there's actually a lot more we want to do than just compiling C and C++, and that's what I'll be talking about near, near the end. Uh, another thing that's under construction is the actual text format. We said, you know, the binary format, we have some amount of convergence. The text format, we know we want to probably want to do something kind of JavaScript-y, um, you know, curly brace family, infix, precedence. Um, but for now, we just have this really ugly S expression format, which is kind of verbose, but it's really simple to parse. And if you haven't seen it before, if you have a tr uh, an expression tree here, we have an, an add with you know, adding an, a get local of x and a constant one. You just write the parent first, and then write the children with spaces and put parentheses around everything. And uh, we have in the spec currently uh, a reference interpreter and a bunch of test cases that, that consume this format. So it allows us to kind of break the chicken and egg cycle and first um, not worry about the text format. Instead, we're focused on what are the operators, what are their semantics, and then we're in the process of putting together a proposal for a real text format now. So bear with me through the S expressions that we'll be seeing in a little bit. And one last thing is, you know, some of the stuff is, is still coming together, so I, I've marked those with the Unicode snowman. So that means this is speculative. It could change in the, before the final release. So with that, with those caveats out of the way, let's, let's take a little tour. So we'll start with some C++ or some C code. A simple function adds two, two ints. And uh, within a bunch of C code, the C code can call each other. If we want to be able to call a given function from JavaScript, we need to export it. And we're using the same metaphor here as you would export a function from a dynamic linked library. So this is you know, the magic Clang syntax you would use to mark a uh, function is exported from a DLL. It's the same thing for exporting it from your WASM module. So ugly, but it's probably already in your build system. You could just use this, this little whatever macro you already have for exporting. And once you've done that, you know, just with that code, you, you, you can compile it to a, a .wasm, so binary. Should be you know, tens of bytes. Um, the, the snowman means that, that what we have now is a WebAssembly backend in progress in upstream LVM, which means you know, we're in the process of being able to make WebAssembly a first class compile target, but we haven't integrated with the Clang compile driver or other compiler drivers. But if we're successful, then hopefully they'll, 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 they'll welcome um, being able to add uh, WebAssemblies uh, as a flag. Uh, so that, that gives us the binary. If we want to see the text, um, Here's, here's our first taste of, the, you know, the, of a module um, viewed as S expressions. So it's, uh, first of it, it is a module, and therefore it has you know, imports and exports. Here we're exporting one thing, which is a function add, named add. And this is the definition of the function. You can see the parameters are typed, left-hand sides and in 32, right -hand side and the result are in 32s. We do the i32 add, and it's an expression language, so you, you know, the final, you know, this expression is the result of the function. So tiny module. 
how do we run it from JavaScript? So this is, the, uh, this is just using the, the fetch API to fetch the bits, and we just fetch this, this file, and we get it back, we get a response, and we say, okay, we want it as bits in array buffer, so we ask for the response in array buffer, and this is, again, not uh, new APIs for WebAssembly, just the fetch API. Then we get the buffer back, we get a typed array view on it, and this is the new WebAssembly function, which uh, says instantiate, you know, compile these bits and give me the resulting instance that I can call. And once you have it, you can just call it like a normal JavaScript function. So here we call add one, two, and uh, it'll give us three. So here's, well, let's demo this in, this in this current browser. So first, just for fun, I'll open the debugger, and we can see, if we you know, go to the button, you can see the code that I was just showing. That's, that's what happens when we click the button as we run that code I just showed. We go to the debugger, you can see there's no WebAssembly here because we have not loaded it. We click, we click uh, run and we fetch the code, we compile it, we run it, we get three, which is the right answer, and this appeared. So this, because we're basically avowing this code, we don't yet have a way to load it as a script. Um, this is the syntax we have for eval. It's, this WASM was compiled at, you know, within index.html. And here's the synthesized text format. And you can see we're generating this fly, and we're taking a lot of steps to show you that it's temporary. <laughs> Don't judge us, please. Um, but you can see roughly the same S expression that we, you know, that was shown on the slide. And this is being generated from the binary on the fly. And it doesn't work at the moment, but work is in progress to be able to like put a breakpoint here, and then you'll be able to step through it just like it was normal JavaScript. So that's what works today. There's a lot of ways we can do better. So one way is integrate with the new Streams API, which is coming. So this lets you overlap compilation with the download. Before, we had to download all the bits, and then we could start compiling it. And for a large application, that can take a few seconds. With Streams, we can do our same fetch and then get a, a stream that is the, you know, the, the stream we're reading from the network and feed that into a function WASM compile, which returns itself a promise that which resolves to that same instance that we can call just like before. So just remove some performance impediments there. Another way we can do better is integrate with the ES6 modules. So you might have noticed these modules are a lot like ES6 modules. They have imports and exports. Well, exactly. So we can, uh, this is just a normal ES6 module. The way the syntax is to, to write one in line, you say type equal module. Then this code is interpreted as the ES6 module code. And so we're doing an import add from a URL that happens to be WASM and that can just work. And you import it and call it. So that's JavaScript calling WebAssembly can also call the other way. And going back to our C code, how does that look? Well, it's instead of a DLL export, it's DLL import, using the same goofy syntax used to import functions across DLLs. The same mark says this is coming from outside. And then we have a function main, which simply calls a passing 42. And we compile it the same way. And the text, you know, the WASM text that pops out is we have an import now that says import print int, and it, we have its signature. And then we have a function main, which calls this import, the zeroth import, passing it 42. And it's, you can see we didn't export main. Instead, it's main. It's the magic main function. And WebAssembly has the ability to mark a, a function as your start function. And when you first instantiate that module, it will run the start function. So main is the obvious start function, since there's a main. So now how do we run that? Well, first we have to write our actual ES6 module that we're importing. And that's really simple. It's just print ints, and it writes to console log. Here, if we uh, have the ES6 module integration, we can load the WASM module directly as an ES6 module. So we, you know, the, this, the only thing that's different here from a normal ES6 module is that this URL gives you WASM bits instead of JavaScript code. So this loads you know, the WASM we just compiled, which imports this JavaScript and it calls it, and so this is all you need to, to run it. And if we want to do it manually with the JS API, we can fetch our bits like we did before. And we can make an import object, which has that same function, this time just as a field, and we can pass in the imports as an extra parameter to that in same uh, function we use to compile our bytes. Okay, so that's importing, exporting. Let's look at some actual computation. So here's a function that sums an array of ints. You know, it goes down from beginning to end, adding a bunch of ints. And this compiles to this X expression, which is pretty noisy at first, and a lot of that's just the lack of the infix syntax. Uh, but we'll slice it up and look at each piece. So we'll start with the local variable int, the sum, and that translates to a local. 
But in WASM, the way to think about locals is as registers. Now, we don't know precisely how many registers you have on your physical machine. Maybe it's seven, or maybe it's 32. So we'd say you can have as many as you want, and it's the job of the compiler to do register allocation. And in cases like this, where there's so few locals, then yeah, they'll all go in registers. Uh, next, pointers. As we were saying earlier, the, the memory is represented as a big array of bytes, so a pointer turns into a, just an integer, which is the index of the byte. And then to load from it, to do this, to do reference, uh, we just do a load of, of that pointer. Loops are also a little, a little different in WASM. Instead of actually giving you the control flow, a loop simply introduces two labels that you can branch to. One label at the, at the end called break, or that we've named break, and one label at the top that we can use to jump back. So if we want to jump to the top of our loop, we have a branch to the top. And if we want to break out, we branch to the break if the condition is that i equals end. And lastly, to do the increments, we just get i, add four, because integers are four, big, and store it back to i. And we're done. That's, that's our, little, our little loop compiled to WebAssembly. So that's the function. If we want to embed this in, now we need to embed it in a module. Uh, there's a declaration to say we use memory, and this is one page of memory, which is specified to be 64 kilobytes. We export the memory so JavaScript can access it. There's our same function that we were looking at in the last slide, and then we export that uh, so we can call it from JavaScript. So now there's two exports. So we start the same way as before. We just compile the module and get our instance back. But now we can get the instance exports memory, create a, a typed array view of it, and then initialize our array of integers. And we can call that passing the pointers, which are just the offsets into that byte array. And we get our result back. So that's the end of this little tour of WASM. Um, what we've seen is calling to and from JavaScript, uh, hopeful ES6 module integration, and a little bit of computation. But what about the APIs? What if we want to go out and do something now other than returning integers? So to back up a little bit, uh, a view of a traditional virtual platform like you know, Java or C Sharp is you have the VM with all its compiler components like GC and uh, the JIT compiler, and that gets to the underlying operating system, audio graphics input, networking storage, through a set of well-specified APIs. Now, when I first started working on, you know, at, on Firefox, my impression of the web was that it was totally different than that. You know, it's, it's this document viewer, and first and foremost, you have all this, you know, this documents, and then there's a little JavaScript VM kind of hiding inside that can reach out and modify the document, and that's your indirect APIs for, for getting to all this stuff. And that's actually, I think, how it started like two decades ago. That was before uh, Netscape was rewritten to Gecko. I think it was maybe even implemented this way. Um, but not anymore. It's, today you can really think about the web as, as a VM. And you know, the, the bytecode of this VM is JavaScript, which is a textual language, which is a little strange. But it is a VM with a GC, JIT compiler, and other components. And those, you can modify the document, but those are just two particular APIs, and there's a bunch more that have been added with HTML5 and beyond, work beyond that are more resembling traditional APIs that offer more direct access to the hardware and a more control. But of course, it, while it is a, resembling a traditional v VM, it has a lot of important webby properties, like you can load any URL without having to trust it because you have this, this uh, security policy that you know, makes sure you, you, you don't have to trust the URL to load it. And uh, in addition to being able to load code into the VM, which gets accesses you know, the machine through the APIs. You can also, there's a fast path that goes straight into the layout and rendering engine with through uh, HTML, CSS, and SVG. So there's some special webby properties in addition to having, being defined by open standards and multiple implementations. And then when you add WebAssembly to this mix, it, it just fits in as a sibling to JavaScript. So if you ask the question, well, what are WebAssembly APIs? The answer is, well, they're, they're web APIs. Um, it's the same ones, and that's an orthogonal consideration, um, what are the set of web APIs as an orthogonal consideration to, to the definition of WebAssembly. So that's, this is very different than previous plugin architectures that have had problems getting adoption. And this is a key part of why we like WebAssembly and we say it has you know, tight integration with the web platform. So what, is, what does it look like to call out to web APIs? So uh, mscripten is a tool chain, that tool chain I was talking uh, a while ago, that in addition to providing the ability to compile your C++ to JavaScript or WebAssembly in the future, it also provides a whole bunch of libraries that map standard C++ interfaces to web APIs. So in this little snippet of code, we're using SDL, which is a popular abstraction library for inputs and graphics, and standard I.O. defined by Libc. 
And this code isn't particularly specific to the web. It would run fine natively. But when you compile it with mscripten, which gives, has its own compile driver, it spits out an HTML file and a JavaScript file. An HTML file, HTML file has a default harness that looks like this. And I'm embedding the output of that in just an iframe. So you have your canvas, which normally that's maybe all you wanted or you have some other UI around it. Uh, we've redirected our standard out just to a text area, but we could have sent it to console log or sent it over the network or whatever. And we have a full screen button, you know, it takes this canvas full screen. But basically, you know, for, you know, with just writing some standard C code, we're, we're able to get to a basic functional uh, application that runs on the web that we can now kind of modify and tweak how we like. So today, to get to web APIs, WebAssembly has to thunk out through JavaScript. There's no direct way to call into web API directly from WebAssembly. Um, and this, this is fine, this is how it's worked for a long time, and often the, the cost of that thunking is amortized by the actual cost of what you're doing once you get to the web API. Um, and that's what that demo is doing, for example. Uh, but we want to do better. So uh, one of the future directions is to support calling web APIs directly, being able to import particular functions that are defined by, you know, via web IDL into the WebAssembly module and then being able to call them directly. Uh, we also want to be able to compile languages other than just C and C++. Currently WebAssembly has this linear memory model, which is like a big array of bytes. And that's great if that's what your language's memory model is, like C, C++, Fortran, or Rust. But if your language has GC, then it's hard at the moment. You would need to basically, your tool chain is going to need to compile a GC and ship that with your application. You're going to have to manage that array of bytes with your own GC that's kind of like layered on top. And you know, that's possible, and we have actually have examples of people doing that with Lua and Python and, and bits of Java. Um, but there's some downsides. It's, you know, it's more code to ship. Uh, it misses optimizations that the browser has done. Things like, you know, this algorithmic things, browsers have generational, compacting, moving, parallel, incremental GCs, but also the browser's GCs are integrated with things like the render loop, so you can render it, do an incremental GC slice that ends as soon as it's time to draw the next frame, so you don't hold up, you know, rendering. Um, another fundamental problem with this, with doing your own GC is, is you'll have a hard time collecting cycles that go from your own GC heap out into the web, out into the DOM and then back because you're going to end up introducing a strong reference that keeps it all alive. So to address all this, we want to provide first class support for GC languages. And uh, this is, you know, in the future, so there's not a bunch of uh, specifics nailed down, but we have the high level goals of adding low level GC primitives that avoid baking in any one particular language's class model. So for example, we would add struct types and array types that allow you to implement Java's V tables and virtual dispatch, but also a different sort of virtual dispatch for a different language. Uh, another goal is to be, share the same GC, G, uh, GC heap as JavaScript so that you can pass jo uh, objects back and forth. It's just the same object and WebAssembly has a statically typed view of that object and JavaScript has a dynamically typed view. And this kind of follows from that previous diagram that shows it's the same platform, it's the same VM, the same GC. Uh, going further, uh, or I guess even just to realize that we need some fundamental extensions, both to WebAssembly and, and JavaScript. One is a proposal that's been around for a while called typed objects. And these are a little like Python C types, let you describe a dynamic object that has a static structure. It's like you sealed the object and then also sealed the types of the properties. This is really good for JavaScript VMs because it allows them to represent these objects unboxed and store like an N32 is simply an N32 without like the normal tag bits. And uh, there's been a proposal around for a while and it's actually in Firefox nightly if you, but only in nightly, it doesn't ship out to release, but you can see there's type objects that you can get to and play around with. Um, but the important thing about typed objects is WebAssembly wants to have a statically typed view of objects. So how do you reconcile that with JavaScript objects, which are fundamentally, fundamentally dictionaries. If you wanted to reflect a dictionary statically in WebAssembly, you would have operations like lookup and, and, and you know, find get key and, and store key, which are going to be slower, or at least won't have all the ahead of time predictability uh, invariants that we want. With typed objects, you can say, here's an object whose structure is immutable, so when viewed from WebAssembly, we can simply access, always know this is a loaded offset 10, and when it flows out to JavaScript, you'll have a reasonable interpretation also, so you can pass them back and forth. Uh, other features we would need are post-mortem post notification, which allow us to do, implement things like finalizers. 
And it's also a long time requested feature of if you compile a C++ library and you want to have some resources that are in the linear memory and you want to have a JavaScript object that's a handle for that, when the JavaScript object becomes garbage, you want to release and know to release your C++ resources. So that way you don't require the programmer to call explicitly dot release, which is a thing people are accustomed to doing in GC language. So post-mortem post notification would say, call me back when this thing is unreachable so I can take some actions. And lastly, weak references, because they're in other languages too. Uh, we need, so that's, that's all things that we need to optimize statically typed GC languages. We need even more features uh, to be able to optimize dynamic languages efficiently. Uh, things like being able to patch the immediate branch targets and return addresses that are actually in your machine code on your stack. This sounds pretty unsafe, but there's good precedent for how uh, we can do these things safely in a, in a machine independent context, but while still allowing WebAssembly VMs the ability to, to do these low level tricks that are the basis for uh, optimizing dynamic language VMs. Also need the ability to make, do fine grained compilation of little bits of code that you jump to and good support for dynamic and any values. So a common question we hear is, well, with WebAssembly, will we be able to compile JavaScript to WebAssembly? And it's a valid question, but it won't go any faster because, first of all, without these features, it'll kind of be interpreted or, 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 or jitted in a very basic way, so it'll run a lot slower. And even with these resources, still, it's, these are things that the JavaScript engine has and more. So it should, you know, except for interesting corner cases where you say, like, oh, I'm going to break the semantics of the language, or I'm going to ship a custom heuristic that's just right for my particular application. Other than those like, kind of long-term future things, it's JavaScript will probably be run best as JavaScript by the JavaScript engine. Uh, right. Another important thing, even for C++, is we need a good source map story. It's nice that you can see the text format associated with the binary, and that kind of corresponds to what you see when you see minified JavaScript. You know, it's pretty low-level stuff. Uh, it's not super easy to read. It's different than what you initially wrote. In JavaScript, we have source maps that take us all the way back to what we, the source we wrote. Uh, for Asm.js code, that technically they work today, but source maps get huge. Like, uh, you know, a few uh, a million lines of C++ might generate a gigabyte of source maps. And it's just that they weren't designed for, for this scale of code. So we need something better, and we also want to be able to do fancier things like interpret memory in the linear memory in a special way instead of just as a sequence of integers. We want to be able to look at that as like a vector of ints or other types of things that a, a C++ debugger would do. And we want to do this without having to specify a huge kind of web dwarf standard. And so there's some interesting plans to do that, but it's out of scope for this talk. But just at a high level, we, we want to be able to debug the source language, not just this kind of low-level assembly-like language. So another question is, how, how do we think this is going to be used? And it's hard to predict the future. Uh, you know, probably the way people use it is something we can't even imagine today. But we can extrapolate from what people are doing today with Asm.js. And there's a spectrum here from very light usage to, to full-on, it's all Asm.js. So on the, on, starting on the light ends, uh, one way that people get it is secretly or implicitly through their JS frameworks. And you might think this is an area where there's nothing computationally into to do, but actually, as we were just hearing yesterday in Yehuda's talk, uh, Ember is experimenting around this because surprisingly, hiding inside of HTML templating engines is a little VM that executes programs that are compiled from your templates. And the job of that program is to, to do the minimal work to map the changes in your data model into the DOM and to minimize how, what, what, uh, how many updates are necessary. So they actually have a VM already, and so the experiment is to say, can we, can we put this VM into Asm.js, which is pretty cool. Uh, stepping a little, using WebAssembly a little more, or compiled code a little more, we have a lot of examples of people compiling particular C++ libraries. So we have the bullet physics engine, compiled to AmmoJS, which is used in some handwritten JS game engines. SQLite, if you want an in-memory relational database in JavaScript. Asm Crypto is a uh, client-side crypto, crypto library that's used by Mega to do their in-browser encryption. CLD is actually shipping in Firefox, and it's a compiled version of a language detector to say, like, what language is, is this probably, so I can apply the appropriate, I guess, language rules. Uh, BA3 is a, a mapping engine that was recently published as a JavaScript API that you can use to do high-performance 3D mapping in your JavaScript app. And then one step more is where it's not just a library, but there's a whole big WebAssembly engine, probably your own code base, that's compiled, but you're still using JavaScript for all the, you know, the UI in the front end. And examples we see of this, Adobe has Lightroom, which is using, they're compiling their actual image manipulation, and that, but it's, it's a headless library, if I understand right, that just uh, renders the pixels. And then if you look at the, the UI, it's all you know, um, JavaScript and HTML, and Math Studio is another example. 
going even farther, there's games where it's nothing where the main UI element is a big canvas in the middle and then you have uh, UI, HTML UI around the, uh, around the sides. Uh, Unity games that are shipping in Facebook tend to use this where it's the Facebook Chrome that goes around the edges and the, the game's embedded as an iframe. And Autodesk <coughs> has a product called Formit that has the same sort of strategy. And lastly, then there's the, it's nothing but one big canvas. And this makes sense for some games where the UI is actually part of the game where you can't really extract it into some separate UI that you would put in HTML. Uh, but what does not particularly excite me is, is this idea that gets brought up from time to time of we'll just re-implement HTML and CSS in WebAssembly rendering to WebGL. I, th I think there's a lot of value in HTML and CSS that that would have a hard time replicating. Um, but it makes sense for, the, for these big game ports and other sorts of intensive visualizations with their own custom UI. So getting back to the original question, will, will WebAssembly uh, replace JavaScript? No, we, we, we don't really think so. And there's a few reasons. Uh, one is JavaScript remains this, has this privileged status on the web of being the one high-level language that you can ship uh, without compiling and it just runs natively in the browser. It's super optimized by now and it's integrated to all you know, the APIs and the tools. It also has an enormous ecosystem that has a lot of momentum, is growing, very vibrant, and we don't see that changing either. In fact, kind of the opposite may happen. We've seen some people already noticing this, which is if you want to have a, a big native app and you want to have a scripting language in that native app, well, JavaScript starts to look like a really good choice because when you compile that native app to the web, well, the JavaScript, you just get to use the browser's JavaScript engine. You don't, to, you don't have to actually send down a JavaScript engine, which is pretty cool. So we think you know, this might actually push JavaScript more to be the scripting language people reach for, and that's actually JavaScript's initial purpose. It was the scripting language for the web that was meant to glue together you know, the big Java applets and the, and the DOM and other stuff like that, and this actually lets it shine at that purpose. So, uh, inclusion, WebAssembly is a binary in text formats. It's a low-level compiler target, not a language. There's many different ways that we expect people to use this, you know, from full-on WebAssembly applications to just implicitly as part of libraries. It's carefully designed to be part of the web platform and a sibling to JavaScript, not a replacement or an alternative. And we want to support a lot more languages in the future. So, thanks for your time, and happy to have any questions. Oh, to uh, find out more, a good entry point is this webassembly.github.io. It's a nice launching point to demos and all the high-level design docs. If you want to compile some WebAssembly yourself, Binarian is a tool that pairs with mscripten. And it's kind of funny. It compiles your C++ to Asm.js and then converts that to WebAssembly because the two are closely enough uh, defined, which was just a really easy way to be able to produce large quantities of WebAssembly from stuff that works today. Yeah, so thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, very cool talk. I'm pretty new to this stuff. It seems really interesting. Uh, it kind of blows my mind that there are people writing C++ um, shims for mscriptum, like the example that you showed of that SDL library. Um, is that a relatively common thing? Like if you have your random C++ code, is it probably just going to now work in Canvas? Or is that like pretty targeted efforts for to, that have been done for certain libraries and certain apps, like what's the scale of this? Yeah, it's a good question. So if you're using portable abstractions already, like SDL is a very common one that people use in games. OpenGL is another good one that has a very direct mapping to WebGL. Um, OpenAL for audio and a few other ones. Then the story is really simple. Um, some things are just fundamentally a little different. Like people use socket libraries and the web doesn't actually have raw TCP sockets as web sockets which have extra security considerations to allow, so you don't blow up in your firewall. Um, so some things do take more changes. So it really depends API by API. Um, in some cases, like Epic, we were able to, they had a very portable code base. And a lot of these code bases are because they're running on all the mobiles, all the desktops, and sometimes consoles. And so they're already portable enough that they factored out the code to here's the common C++, which is 99% you know, of it, and then here's the platform specific bits. And sometimes it's just as simple as, okay, it's just one more platform. Here's what we do here, here's what we do here. And script allows you to write inline assembly as JavaScript. So sometimes it's simple as just, you know, in the else if, you know, web, <laughs> as, you know, asm, and then you run, write a little JavaScript. <laughs> and, then, and then it calls out to do whatever a web API wants to do. Um, so it, it really depends on the project, but some people have had, you know, really easy experiences and they're amazed. And uh, you know, other people, it's, it's been more work. Like if you have a JIT that generates x86, you're gonna have a harder time, you know. Uh, 
If you do conservative stack scanning where you alias the stack as bytes, you know, for a Bohm GC, that's going to have a hard time. You know, so, so some things are categorically harder. Uh, so it, it depends. So uh, it sounds like you guys have really ambitious plans. It sounds impressive. Um, my question is, if you guys do all those things and they're done, other than having a compilation step, um, would any given language with a little support from the language creator or the community um, be just as first class in the browser as JavaScript? I mean, be able to do and uh, execute as quickly as JavaScript does? Yeah, it's a really good question. So. Yeah, so when you're saying, assuming we've done all this, which is we're maybe on a five year time scale here, you know, so right. we'll assume that. And you said the other important thing, which is there's a compile step. Um, another big fa uh, um, you know, facet is, is your library situation. Some libraries just don't map very naturally to web APIs, and, and, and some do. So that would be one thing that the community would really want to, and, and that whole tools, you know, the whole ecosystem would have to help in saying, you know, these are the libraries that, that have web ports, you know, for them. So that'd be one thing. Um, and then another thing is sometimes languages will have like really unique control flow constructs. Now, in a lot of those cases, we want to analyze and say like, what is the minimal thing we could do to implement to allow that? So just a particular example is coroutines. And what you want to be able to do there is swap stacks. And what we have now in WebAssembly doesn't allow to do that. The stack is opaque, which is really good for security purposes and predictability and a lot of other good reasons. But what we would want to have is the ability to have first class stacks where you abstractly allocate a stack, you can have multiple, and there's a swap, and that's all could be well defined, deterministic, and safe. And that would allow things like coroutines, which is, you know, that would enable a whole class of language features that can't run efficiently today. So the question is, you know, would, does that language have any of those particular features that are like fundamental to the language that, that don't have a current safe mapping? Um, but with, if none of those were problems, then yeah, they, the goal is, yeah, it should, you should be able to debug that source in your dev tools, um, remotely even, you know, is, is a feature coming to browsers. So we think we can, yeah, can make a lot of languages feel really pretty first class. Thanks. All right. Well, good. Thank you. Thank you.